Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining both physically and virtually the first specialty update uh, organized by the Ceylon College of Physicians together with Sri Lanka uh, College, for Cardio College of Cardiologists. Uh, we are very grateful for the uh, Sri Lanka College of Cardiologists for partnering with us to have a very informative uh, specialty update uh, this year. And I welcome Dr. Chandika Ponaperuma for uh, joining with me to co-chair this session and to introduce the first speaker. Over to you, Chandrika. Yes, uh, first speaker doesn't need any words of introduction. He's uh, Dr. W.S. Santaraj, MBBS, MD, FACC, FCCP, FRCP, FESC. He was the past senior consultant cardiologist at Institute of Cardiology National Hospital, Sri Lanka. And uh, currently he works in the private sector at Durden's Hospital Navaloka Ho and Navaloka Hospital. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chandrika. Uh, first, let me thank the Sloan College of Physicians and the Sri Lanka College of Cardiology to inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, actually, Chandrika gave me the liberty to choose what I have to speak in, the, in this topic because it's a very wide topic, new things. And uh, what I thought is I will talk a little about um, heart failure, what is the new developments. Uh, I will not talk about the established therapies, because that uh, you hear everything in the conferences and the guidelines you see. But I will talk what is going to happen. We are, see a lot of young people here. What is going to happen for the next five years? So maybe within five years, what are the changes going to happen? I'll talk on that. Uh, control of lipidemia, lip, uh, dyslipidemias, those are the two topics I am going to go in detail. But um, what I would do is, um, uh, if I have uh, time, if time permits, I will touch on the other topics as well. Now, if you take the acute heart failure management, um, it's changing. So I thought of taking up that topic. So the clinical assessment uh, include, by, they can come as an acute chronic problem or they can come to you first time as an acute heart failure patient. So the clinical assessment would be fatigue, dyspnea, orthopnea, edema, and body weight. And a physical examination, you can say raised jungla uh, venous pressure, basal crepitations, and, uh, and hepatomegaly, and so on. But um, when you are assessing them, uh, the ultrasound is coming more involved in assessing acute heart failures, because when you, if you have a bedside ultrasound machine, you can do a focus, and uh, you can scan the lungs, and you can, you can demonstrate fair amount of B lines. You can see whether it is um, whether the patient has pulmonary edema or not. You can scan the pleura and see whether there is pleural effusions. You can scan the inferior vena cava and see the fluid status, whether it's dilated or not. And um, the SITs also you can uh, scan with the ultrasound machine. It is very cost effective. If you have an ultrasound machine, it is you need not to um, spend a lot of uh, money on other investigation. The biological investigation involved the uh, recommended ones are natriuretic peptides. I don't know whether how um, relevant to our setup, like in the general hospitals, because it's very expensive investigation. But you can do it natriuretic peptides and hematocrit. And um, the current treatment uh, for an acute heart failure is um, if, they, if they come with congestion, the first thing you have to get rid of the congestion. For that, you use a loop diuretic. And uh, if the patient has been already on loop diuretic, you might have to give um, uh, one to two times of uh, the dose intravenously, they are their current dose. If they are uh, not on loop di the diuretic, then of course you can start with 20 to 40 milligram IV. And then you have to monitor the response to your treatment. Uh, 
The best way of monitoring the treatment is do a two hours pot urine sodium levels and uh, after six hours assess the average urine output. If the spot urine mm, sodium level is 50 to 70 percent, 70 milli equivalents, over six hours our urine output is more than 100 to 150 ml per hour, then of course you have achieved the good um, urine output and the decongestion will occur. Now if you don't achieve these levels, then of course the current guideline says you have to increase the diuretic dose, right, and the first day, right, and you can wait till the second day, and again you can increase double the diuretic dose, you got to go on uh, increasing the diuretic dose, then only they say you might consider giving um, other medications like thiazide, acetazolamide, and um, the STLT2 inhibitors. But there are, the last few months, the, the light has finally appeared in the end of the tunnel for acute decompensated heart failure because of these three trials. That is ADVO with the acetazolamide, impulse with empagliflozacin, and deliver with depagliflozacin. Those two are SGLT2 inhibitors. This acetazolamide study, uh, can I... Put the pointer here, please. The acetazolamide study uh, studied um, how, uh, when you start the acetazolamide in day one, whether the decongestion is achieved um, better than just using the diuretic. So what they a successful decongestion occurred more, more often in acetazolamide group than the placebo group. Those are the findings. And the safety was the incidence of adverse events, including the worsening of kidney function, hypokalemia, and hypotension were similar in both groups. So when you use acetazolamide early in decongested heart failure, you can achieve a successful decongestion within three days. And the congestion core is reduced and also a successful decongestion on discharge. It, is, it was um, uh, helpful in all type of patient. If you take any age, uh, left ventricular function, level of BNPs, male or female, but particularly you can see in a lower GFRs, less than 37, 39, in, low, low, uh, in, in lower GFR situations also, it was better. So you can even use, if the patient's GFR is low, this can be used to achieve adequate re de um, uh, decongestion. And it was also not um, related to the dose of diuretic frusomide you are using. The conclusions were the addition of acetazolamide to loop diuretic therapy in patients with acute decompensated heart failure resulted in greater incidence of successful decongestion. So you can see in the diagram here, so the acetazolamide can be started on the day one. That is, you assess the uh, diuretic um, response. If the sodium level is not achieved or the urine output is not achieved, you can start on acetazolamide to achieve the decongestion. So it's a day one drug and it should not be used for a long period of time. It should be used maximum of three days. That is the recommendation. And um, that's what it is a short uh, mark there. So you can use it for maximum three days in a, in a, during the hospital admission. The second one is the impulse study, which was published uh, this year. Again, it is the empagliflozacin in acute heart failure trial. You can see to evaluate the effect of empagliflozacin decongestion related in points, weight loss. Um, change in the B, uh, BNP levels in hemoconcentration. You can see in all parameters the body weight, body weight per, adjusted to the loop diuretic, hemoconcentration, and congestion score all were reduced um, in the empagliflozacin group when you check, uh, compare with a placebo group in acute heart failure. Again, I have to make a small Correction, that is the initial empagliflozacin in acute heart failure patient after initial in-hospital stabilization. 
this is not a medication like um, acetazolamide directly start on the first day right so you have to assess the patient very well if the patient is having severe infections or very insulin deficient in that type of a patient i think you should not use um, you should not use uh, empagliflozacin as a first line drug on the first day so you can this is the drug you should start at least on the second day like that you can see the bar it start bit late so it you have to be start on the second day or third day but during the hospital admission you can start it so the results in early effective and sustained improvement in all these decongestion indices which is associated with clinical benefits even at day 19 so it you start it as acute drug and you can use it as a chronic medication in all heart failure patients so once you treat the acute um, heart failure once you achieve the decongestion then is the, that is the time to start the guideline directed medication there are four cornerstones you know ac inhibitors ani and that type of drugs and beta blockers mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and sglt2 inhibitors all should be started ideally before they are discharged and they should be titrated and in the next few weeks and um, probably the sglt2 inhibitors you need not to titrate you can start with the same dose 10 mg empagliflozacin process and straight away and this is the paper of interest i uh, saw um i thought it will be helpful this is an accelerated and personalized therapy for heart failure patient with reduced ejection fraction now what we have been following up in heart failure uh, therapy is now once you achieve the decongestion after that you gradually start the medications like uh, first you start the ac inhibitors after that beta blockers after that if necessary start the mineralocorticoid anti antagonist and then uh, you start the sglt2 inhibitors and we do it over a period of one month or so so there was a study recently this called a strong heart failure trial in that trial they have demonstrated that if you can start this agent quickly and uh, get them within one or two weeks within the one or two weeks if you can start all these medicine then you can reduce the mortality and morbidity that is a um, you can see in the second bar here but now this paper describe now the sequence of starting the medication which drug to start bef- as a first and then continue the others you can see in this they actually meta analyzed all these heart failure trials soul merit emphasis and paradigm and the dapa heart failure trials and they have noticed that the sequence 2 that is here you can see the sglt2 inhibitors this is after treating the decongestion sglt2 inhibitors then mineral um, the, the mras and after that um the ac inhibitors and beta blockers that is the beta blockers and ac inhibitors give the better results uh, out of all these combinations so that is again a new thing i don't know it will come up in um, the future few future discussions i think that's a food for thought i will also talk a little bit about iron deficiency anemia in heart failure we don't consider iron deficiency anemia much in heart failure we are always Uh, preoccupied with the medications right to these for 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 cornerstone medication but iron deficiency also cause lot of morbidity and mortality in heart failure the definition of iron deficiency in heart failure is a ferritin concentration less than 100 nanograms per milliliter or a ferritin concentration is between 100 and 299 nanometer nanogram per milliliter in combination with the transferritin saturation less than 20 that's a definition so how can patients get iron deficiency there are two things it can be absolute iron deficiency due to insufficient nutrition impaired absorption and so on so it can be a functional iron deficiency like reduced uh, circulating iron um because of the inflammatory status so you can see in this diagram in heart failure patient the inflammation is um is the most important thing that can increase the hepcidin that's an um, protein produced by the liver that of course can impair the absorption and transport of iron 
in the circulation. That's one of the mechanisms in heart failure. Patients can get iron deficiency. So you can see the iron deficiency causes uh, increase in the mortality, hospitalization, and reduce the quality of life and functional status. So you can see uh, if you treat the iron deficiency with IV iron, you can see you can reduce the first heart failure hospitalization, cardiovascular and cardiovascular mortality, although the cardiovascular mortality reduction is not like the uh, hospitalization. And um, also there is an interesting phenomena uh, noticed in one of those journals. I thought I will introduce that also. In the EMPA heart cardiolink 6 study, the EMPA glyphosin is shown to improve the erythropoietin levels in uh, patients with cardiac problems. The, um, the mechanisms are several. It can um, uh, reduce the, re reduce the renal, renal, renal metabolic demands and also reduce the partial, pre reduce the partial pressure of oxygen in the, the uh, renal tubules. And um, afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction all can contribute to um, increase the erythropoietin levels. So in this study, they have shown that um, the patients who have been treated with tempagliflozacin uh, increased the hematocrit significantly. And uh, it is same with the uh, dapagliflozacin in the panel B, what you see there. So the, uh, iron, uh, the iron deficiency in heart failure is common. And it's about 60% of the patients with heart failure can have iron deficiency. Iron deficiency is associated with an increased risk of hospitalization, and um, um, it is uh, regardless of whether it's a reduced ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction. Oral, oral ion therapies are not useful because um, the absorption status, the side effects, and all other things cause oral ion, uh, oral ion is not a good way of treating heart failure. The evidence for using IV ion in heart failure patients with iron deficiency is much stronger and other routes of application. There is emerging evidence that HELT2 inhibitors improves anemia. Finishing the heart failure, I thought of taking the time is okay. Ne? Uh, if that is, you can stop me in that time. So uh, the, I'll speak to you a little about the control of dyslipidemias, um, emerging non satin therapies. Now, if you take this diagram, um, you see a range of LDL cholesterol levels in the left side, left extreme level, what you see is a very high LDL level. You can see about 750 milligrams. This you usually find in homozygous hypercholesterolemia patients. They usually don't have LDL receptors in the liver server. They are familial. Uh, actually, uh, uh, there are a few families in Sri Lanka. Their LDL cholesterols are about more than 1,000. Um, so that type of families are there. So in these patients, if you don't treat, what will happen is they get early atherosclerosis. You can see they develop atherosclerosis when they are teens. 13 years, 14 years, they can get atherosclerosis. The second one is around 200 LDL level. That is, uh, these are the patient heterozygous type of um, athero, the hypercholesterolemia. They have LDL uh, receptors, but if you don't treat them again, you can see if they have high risk, they can get in 20s, and if they have, don't have any risk factors, again, before 48, 40 years, they can develop uh, coronary artery disease. This 100 milligram is the normal population. You can see even with the 100 milligram of LDL, in a normal population, if they have risk factors like male sex, hypertension, diabetes, or smoking, you can see the risk is high. They can develop coronary artery disease in uh, 40, 40s, right? So that's the reason reducing the cholesterol further, reducing the LDL cholesterol further can improve the prognosis of these patients. Now, if you shift the curve on the right extreme, you can see if you bring the LDL cholesterol down, in, especially in patients in the high-risk groups, those who have hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and that type of a group, 
you can um, reduce the onset of um, coronary artery disease or heart disease later in life in 60s or so. That's the reason the current guideline says that, that uh, risk mediated LDL target. So according to the risk, you reduce the LDL target. So if they are very high risk, the LDL target is 55 milligrams. How are you going to achieve that 55 milligrams? It is, um, can you achieve it settings or you think sometime it may not be possible. So that's why right. there are people were developing different, different type of uh, cholesterol lowering agents. Now, you can see there are several cholesterol lowering agents, but I will, I'm going to talk to you about this agent that English ran, which, um, uh, which is uh, of importance. This again shows from 1995 how the different, different type of agents we were able to reduce the LDL cholesterol. Now with the presently available medications, uh, moderate intensity statin will reduce the LDL by about 30%. High intensity statin will reduce about 50%. And uh, high intensity statin and nesetimibe will reduce it about 65%. And the monoclonal antibodies, if you add to this, you can achieve a 60% reduction in the uh, LDL cholesterol level. Now, what is the problem with treating these patients with cholesterol? Now, if you take the reducing the cholesterol levels, so LDL levels, is not a short-term thing. It is going to be a long-term thing. If you reduce the LDL cholesterol today, you are going to get the benefit after 10 years. That's what you have to look at. It's a long-term uh, uh, long prognostic thing. So you can see if it is a statin, they have to uh, take 60, 365 pills for a year. And... Um, if it is a monoclonal antibodies, again, they have to inject it twice a month to get, a, get the cholesterol. And also, the adherence is very important. So when you start at taking pills, the adherence is very low. So when you reduce the frequency of um, injection, the, the medication, then, of course, the adherence will, will be more. Uh, that's, a, that, that, that's a rationale of developing more um, infrequent dosing medication in LDL cholesterol controlling elastic cholesterol. So uh, new medication which was um, uh, uh, actually uh, introduced is the small in, um, small MR uh, small, small interfering RNA uh, medication. These three actually you can see the statin, acetamide and PCSK9 antibody which are already in guidelines and established practice. I am, want, I am going to talk on this Inclisaran, it's a PCSK9, small interfering mRNA, this is not uh, new for you all because this technology was uh, used um, uh, you know, two, about two or three years ago. These patients were on um, phase two, phase three trials. That's how the COVID struck. So, the COVID vaccine was based on this, this developed because they knew that these drugs are safe because they cost only mild injection site infection. So based on this only, they were able to make the COVID vaccine very quickly because these, uh, these trials were already almost finished when the COVID struck the world. So the um, small interfering mRNA medications it interferes with the mRNA and degrade uh, the mRNA which is producing the particular protein PCSK9 that is responsible for increasing the LDL cholesterol in different different mechanisms. I will not go through that. Now, RNA targeting is a novel therapeutic approach in cardiovascular prevention. The liver specific drug delivery is enhanced by the N acetyl galactosamine conjunction. Specific targeting, specifically its target, PCSK9. And uh, it's again, it targets uh, uh, mRNA and reduce uh, this ribosome producing the, um, the, the protein is uh, targeted. It is studied in uh, trial course Orion. 
it's a, the sorry one trial uh, was done in different different phases this phase 3 trial is the orion 10 and 12 and it's also been studied in uh, familial uh, hypercholesterolemia homozygous and heterozygous and you can see this orion 10 and 12 uh, parallel studies which was done in us and europe and south africa and you can see the, these are two injections a year. This, uh, you have to give only two. Every six months, these injections are given. And you can achieve almost about 50% reduction in the LDL cholesterol levels. You can see, uh, when compared with the placebo, the increase rand reduced the um, LDL cholesterol level almost 10% uh, in both studies. And the PCSK levels also correspondingly lower in this group. So it is a subcutaneous glycerin injection, day one, day nine, and then the and then every six months lowered the time-adjusted LDL cholesterol level almost 50 percent. A regime of glycerin every six months was feasible and significantly reduces the LDL cholesterol level by approximately 50 percent. Uh, the only adverse effects uh, of concern is injection site. Um, uh, uh, problems. So it is uh, aiming for a lower LDL cholesterol goal. Having more options is better when you are having medication likes. And you, you can achieve about 50% annualized LDL cholesterol level reduction uh, with uh, biannual dosing of inclisiran. When you compare it with the statin, it's only about 23 milligrams you can reduce. What are the other use of small interfering RNA therapies that uh, medications are de developed uh, for the treatment of amyloidosis? It is already been approved. Um, drug, and also, it's for interest in hypertension, Zilbesiran is uh, being developed. This is going to be again a twice a year injection for hypertension, targeting angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 enzymes. Um, a little bit of uh, uh, further into the uh, LDL cholesterol lowering, a new technology has been developed. This is called CRISPR. It is not only in the LDL cholesterol, in the other uh, fields as well. CRISPR-Cas9 technology, it was developed by Jennifer and Emmanuel Carpentier, um, and they, were, they received the Nobel Prize for this. And uh, CRISPR-9 uh, CRISPR gene editing technique as with the precision allowing the researchers to remove and insert the DNA in desired location. So what's the situation about the uh, LDL cholesterol lowering drugs? Now we can, with the, that technique, you can actually interfere with the uh, gene which producing the PCSK9 and, uh, premature, and prematurely terminate P, PCSK9 uh, uh, synthesis. So it was studied in primates and uh, published in this Nature Journal. And what they have noticed is after um, injecting lipid nanoparticles, they, they were able to achieve PCSK9 uh, and the lower uh, density lipoprotein reduction, 90% and 60% respectively. And all these changes remain stable for eight months after a single dose of uh, therapy. So it was published. It was presented in the American uh, College of American uh, Heart Association last year, and also it showed. You can see with uh, it, it, the agent is Wave one zero one, and the uh, reduction of uh, PCSK nine and cholesterol levels were very significant. And the human uh, phase two trials have already started. Or they are uh, they are going to enroll about forty patients to study on this. So we have to see this study. This is going to be only one injection in the LDL cholesterol levels. For we are going to be permanently, it's going to be low. It's going to be an ideal medication for patients with uh, whom I have shown. This is a familial hypercholesterolemia uh, patient. We have uh, the, uh, the treatment is, uh, at the moment, the treatment is very difficult. Do I have some time? Uh, five minutes. Ah, I can finish it. These are all one or two slides. I will quick finish it. So polygenic risk goes. Now, assessing the risk for cardiovascular disease, they have developed so many risk goes. These, um, now, if you take some time, you come across the clinical medicine, a young person 
for 30 year old man coming with a myocardial infarction you search for a cause you can't find because uh, there is no respecters nothing a perfectly healthy person so how to identify this group of people so people thought with the risk cause what we are using if you can add the genetic risk cause that to get the genetic risk cause you have to have a lot of data that is genetics should be uh, genetic genetic information should be uh, loaded into the system so if you can do that then you can predict the um, the, the, the the onset of the disease well than the uh, just using normal scores. It is true for atrial fibrillation. You can, if you add the genetic um, prediction, it will be much better. So, polygenic risk scores incorporated into genetics, um, into risk prediction frameworks, offers an opportunity to refine risk and creation of earlier and tailored risk reduction strategies. A simple supporting example is family history of premature cardiovascular disease has with 50% uh, higher odds of CVDs in middle-aged adults independent of clinical risk factor. These you can't find with no using normal scores. And uh, I will skip this, uh, some of those, and I will finish with this. Uh, clonal hematopoiesis as a risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The presence of CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis in peripheral blood cells was associated with nearly a doubling in the risk of coronary artery disease in humans and the well with the accelerated atherosclerosis. So the aging humans commonly develop leukocytes clones in the blood due to somatic mutation in the stem cells. The clonal hematopoiesis constitutes an independent cardiovascular risk factor. Individual with clonal hematopoiesis will increasingly present to cardiovascular specialists for management. So these um, hemopoietic cells, they come from the clonal expression, and you can see they are more, if you can find them in the peripheral blood, there's a 40% increase in the accelerated atherosclerosis, thrombosis, and heart failure. And um, the hematological, it doesn't predict a lot in the hematological malignancy, if they, if they have it in the blood, you can't say they are going to get hematological malignancies. But you can predict these people develop atherosclerotic disease. So there are two recent papers you can see. This is uh, studied on the heart failure um, in a different, different trials. You can see those who, who with the chip, they have a 25% increase in the heart failure risk. So identifying these cells in the periphery, you can actually predict the heart failure. And also you can see in this trial, they have uh, this, trial, this paper, they have mentioned those who are with the cardiogenic shock management. Um, they have seen if the patient has chip in their blood, they uh, fare badly because they, they uh, then the people who have no chips. Um, so the current findings are support the clinical relevance of the chip in cardiovascular disease and establish it, its position as an independent cardiovascular risk factor. Chip can be also utilized to predict and risk stratify patients with cardiovascular problems like heart failure and cardiogenic shock. You can expect chip can be a biomarker in future in cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Just uh, can you wait, uh, sir? We can take up one or two questions if there are any from the audience. Questions from the audience. I have one question. <laughs> so, when uh, these new lipid lowering drugs are used in patients who, as a secondary prevention, that is for patients who already have atherosclerosis disease, do they provide the same benefit of statins of plaque stabilization and re reduced acute coronary syndromes? And, uh, yeah, yes, that we are getting more and more information on that. But they say that, see there, now it's the LDL level is the most important thing. So they, the lower the LDL level, though the low, lower the cardiovascular incidence. So that's the reason these non-statin therapies are also getting popular. So however, that's what earlier they thought only statins has those effects. But that's the reason they added the acetamide again in the guidelines because they, they saw that adding acetamide again is very beneficial. In the same time, in these um, new lipid-lowering agents also, 
can, if you can reduce the LDL cholesterol level to that particular target, then you achieve that benefit. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, in absence of any other questions, uh, we have a, a, a certificate of appreciation for participating in this uh, on behalf of the College of Physicians. Uh, next speaker today is uh, Dr. Sunit Karunaratna, MBBS, MD, MRCP, MRCPS, and MRCP Specialty Certificate in Diabetes, Consultant Cardiologist Teaching Hospital, Anuradhapura. Dr. Sunit Karunaratna will be talking to us today on acute coronary syndromes, the Sri Lankan perspective. Over to you, Sunit. Uh, first, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me uh, to talk about acute coronary syndromes in the uh, Sri Lankan setting. And I'm actually uh, privileged to uh, be here and present uh, among one of, uh, few of the senior most cardiologists. Actually, three of my mentors, Dr. Shantaraj and Dr. Gota Singh and Dr. Chandrika Ponlampirma, all are here. So, looking at the acute coronary syndromes, uh, what is what we see in Sri Lanka? Ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of in-hospital mortality in Sri Lanka, and acute coronary syndromes uh, take up a major part of these deaths. Uh, and they have done a small study which showed nearly 7% of admissions to emergency departments were due to acute coronary syndrome. So it's a very high disease burden. Evidence-based guidelines uh, give clear directions to the management of acute coronary syndromes. Uh, mainly we go by the uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines and American College of Cardiology guidelines as well as we have our own set of guidelines. Uh, but applying these guidelines to Sri Lankan healthcare system may not be very straightforward, uh, as you all already aware, with the resource limitations and other problems. So we need uh, we need data. Data on quality of care in acute coronary syndrome are sparse and uh, from uh, lower and mid uh, middle level income countries like from Sri Lanka, despite having a very high disease burden. So I actually, uh, when I have had a look, I, had, I found a few studies. One was a study of patients who presented with acute coronary syndrome to an emergency department tertiary care hospital in Sri Lanka, which was done in Kurunagala. Uh, just a small study, but it's very informative. And there is a, a first national level audit uh, done by Dr. Priyadarshani Galapathy and others, management characteristics and outcomes of patients with acute coronary syndrome in Sri Lanka. And there is this brief uh, report by uh, Dr. Gota Beranus and others uh, about the change in landscape of STEMI care in Sri Lanka, describing the uh, wagon wheel model for primary PCI. And then again, there was uh, another publication in, uh, which is based on the first uh, the registry data from Sri Lanka, quality evaluation, future priorities for delivering acute myocardial infarction care in Sri Lanka. Uh, so we'll first dis discuss a little bit about, about demographics of acute coronary syndromes in Sri Lanka and how they present and the acute management, secondary prevention, cardiac rehabilitation, and primordial prevention and the future directives uh, regarding acute coronary syndromes in Sri Lankan setting. So... Uh, this is actually uh, two weeks before, a 28-year-old gentleman presented with epigastric burning pain for two days. Uh, the pain was persisting despite antacid spills and his usual treatment for gastritis. Uh, he presented to the emergency department. ECG was normal. Troponin was found to be very high. You can see there was occlusion in the right coronary artery. So he proceeded to open up the right coronary artery. And there's uh, this uh, boy came only last week, a 21-year-old presenting with chest pain, initially managed in the medical ward as coronary artery spasm because there was a history of substance abuse. You can see ECG shows biphasic T waves in uh, anterior leads, suggesting a valence pattern. And the coronary angiogram showed there is a 
significant stenosis in the left anterior descending artery with, with a huge clot bed. So whether uh, the demographics in our country are different from uh, the Western countries. No. So we looked at those two studies I earlier mentioned, mean age of acute coronary syndrome was 61 uh, in the uh, audit, island-wide audit, and the registry data showed the uh, mean age was 54 years. And despite these values, we are seeing increase, increase in numbers of young people with acute coronary syndromes in the 20 to 30 age group. And many have delayed diagnosis since acute coronary syndrome is not routinely considered in this group of people. Uh, many are treated for gastroesophageal reflux disease or musculoskeletal chest pain. Uh, and acute MI and sudden death of relatively young people during sporting events is also uh, we see frequently in these days. Uh, we also see an increase in trend in females. 30 to 40 year age group females been diagnosed with acute coronary syndromes uh, in the recent past. And in Sri Lankan setting, when we uh, when when we get patients with acute coronary syndromes, multi vessel disease, diffuse severe disease, and left main disease are frequently seen at a relatively young age. Now, in Western countries, this kind of severe disease, severe, you can see that severe left main disease. And the same patient, LAD is completely occluded and multivessel disease, and the right coronary artery is also completely occluded. So, this patient presented a non elevation MI, and there was, uh, although he was 47 years, there was diffuse severe disease. Uh, so, when we look at the data from uh, the island wide audit, uh, when you look at the past medical history, the commonest risk factor among the patients were, was hypertension. Nearly 45 to 50 percent of patients present with acute coronary syndrome had hypertension. And then diabetes, about 30 percent had diabetes, uh, and hypercholesterolemia, yeah, about uh, 15 to 18 percent. So, as I said earlier, you, you see. Uh, young females. This is 32-year-old female presenting with anterior estilation myocardial infarction. So therefore, we have to think even if the patient is young, we have to suspect, we have to have a high index of suspicion uh, whether they, have, they are having an acute coronary syndrome. So sometimes these patients present exactly like a gastroesophageal reflux disease. They will come and tell you, you have uh, the patient, the I have epigastric pain, burning pain, uh, which is relieved by a uh, burping and taking a warm sip of water, right? I took my usual antacid pills and I took some pantoprazole. I still have some pain, some discomfort. That's why I came to take ECG. So those kind of uh, occurrences are nowadays we, seeing, we are seeing common, commonly than we used to in the earlier days. So then we come uh, after discussing a little bit of about the demographic changes in our setting. We'll discuss a little bit about presentation. So there were two studies. One study is based on it's, it's, it's actually a systematic review uh, from middle income countries. Uh, so they found mean time from symptom onset to first medical contact 12.7 hours, very long duration in acute coronary syndromes. And there's a Swedish study which showed average time was about two hours, depending on whether they contacted the emergency medical services or other uh, hotline. So there is a huge difference in middle income countries and uh, Western countries uh, when we consider the patient related delay from symptom onset to presentation. Right, so the ESC guidelines, which, uh, which were released in 2017, gave clear guidelines to, uh, to minimize system-related delay. Patient-related delay, of course, you have to address by uh, health education and awareness programs. So, so it, it is recommended that the pre-hospital management of STEMI patients is based on regional networks designed to deliver reperfusion therapy expeditiously and effectively efforts made to make primary PCA available to as many patients as possible. 
and it is recommended by that primary PCI centers deliver 24-7 service and it is also recommended patients transfer to PCI capable center for primary PCI bypass the emergency department and CCU, ICCU and transfer directly to the cath lab. Uh, and it is recommended the ambulance teams are trained and equipped to identify STEMI and administer initial therapy including fibrinolysis when you can't take the patient for primary PCI because of the time delays. Now, all those, all, all those are uh, class 1 recommendations with level B and level C evidence. Unfortunately, many of these recommendations can't be adhered to in our setting because of the, uh, we don't have trained paramedics who can do a uh, pre-hospital ECG. We do not have the pre-hospital thrombolysis facility. And the, for many of, uh, for the most part, majority of our population, primary PCI is simply not available uh, in a timely manner. And, uh, and it is also recommended the whole hospitals and emergency medical services participating in the care of patients STEMI and record and audit delay times and work to achieve and maintain quality targets. So th for this actually, we need a, uh, this is why we need a registry. So we have to see what, where the delays are happening and then only we can take steps to minimize those delays. And also, another important thing for our setting, it is recommended that patients presenting to a non-PCI capable hospital and awaiting transportation for primary PCI or rescue PCI are attended in an appropriately monitored area. So sometimes we have observed when we, we work in the National Hospital Cardiac Cath Lab, the patients we have accepted for primary PCI or rescue PCI sometimes uh, are, they are not uh, transported in a timely manner because what happens is from the other peripheral hospitals where they do not have the primary PCI facility after the patient was accepted by the cardiology team, uh, there is no follow-up on that. Uh, the person who spoke to us, maybe his, uh, his shift is over, so sometimes they are, there are undue delays and sometimes even they are not closely monitored. So as young doctors, it's your duty that when the patient is accept accepted for primary PCI or rescue PCI, you should ensure that patient is appropriately monitored and as you are the team leader, it's your duty to expedite the pro procedure of transferring the patient. And also it is very important for you to uh, inform the ambulance driver if you are a house officer, because they always always try to, I mean, if the patient is coming to the National Hospital, National Hospital Cardiac Cath Lab, they will, they are, their practice is usually to go to the OPD first and then bring the patient, uh, register the patient and then bring the patient to the cardiology unit CCU. So you have to inform them now this is an emergency you have to take the patient directly to the cath lab uh, to minimize the delays. And the registration and everything can be done after you uh, hand over the patient to the uh, cardiac cath lab. So actually we all, as cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, want, what we need is a patient and the ECG. That's all we need. So we have to, uh, uh, the, there, there is increased proportion of delayed presentation compared to other countries. So patient-related factors such as lack of awareness and poor transport facilities has to be addressed. And even in NHSL, uh, the registry studies showed that only 7% presented directly through ambulance, others arrived by private vehicles. Uh, and establishment of a well-trained paramedic and ambulance service is also a need. Uh, when, when in this registry in patients with STEMI, reperfusion therapy was offered to only to 66% patients. Late presentation was the most common reason for not receiving reperfusion therapy. Uh, and this uh, slide demonstrates uh, the total ischemic time. Total ischemic time is when the patient gets the symptoms un until the arteries, infarct related arteries, open either by thrombolytic therapy or by uh, primary PCI. So this constitutes many components. One is the first one is patient related delay. Other one is delays in the system. So the pa to minimize the patient related delay, of course, you have to address many factors, including transport issues and if possible, island wide availability of a well trained uh, ambulance service. Now in Anuradhapur, we get many patients. They had chest pain from last night, but they come on next morning because they are afraid there will be elephants on the road. So that is, those are the issues we face. 
So moving on to the acute management of acute uh, coronary syndromes, uh, you can see here uh, the data from the audit. The that of course only a small number underwent primary PCA. So if you look at uh, reperfusion therapy by thrombolytics, uh, sixty-six point nine percent were reperfused and majority were by uh, fibrinolytics. And at those times, actually, streptokinase was predominantly used, but nowadays it has changed. We are using uh, tenecteplase most of the time. So the ESC guidelines again say reperfusion therapy is indicating all patients' symptoms of ischemia of less than 12 hours duration and persistent ST segment elevation. A primary PCI strategy is recommended over fibrinolysis within indicated time frames. If primary PCI cannot be performed timely after STEMI diagnosis, fibrinolytic therapy is recommended within 12 hours of symptom onset in patients without contraindications. So primary PCI, if it's not available, still you have a class one recommendation. So you have to, you have to uh, uh, thrombolyze the patient as soon as possible, especially in the first two hours of STEMI, uh, the results, the vessel patency rates after uh, uh, primary PCI and fibrinolytic therapy are almost equal. So therefore, if the patient is, uh, is better without having undue delay for transfer for PCI, if you can deliver thrombolytic therapy in an expeditious manner. Right. Uh, a routine primary PCI strat strategy should be considered in patients presenting late. So if the patient presents late, the value of thrombolytic therapy is actually less. So then uh, primary PCI has, uh, the, the, the indication is more for primary PCI. But still, uh, I mean, although the guidelines say this, after four to six hours of uh, total occluded artery, we, most of the time we see there are results after, even after uh, primary PCI or thrombolysis, the results are not very good. Many, many of them have severe LV dysfunction after four to six hours. Um, and looking at door to needle time and door to balloon time, um, I mean, uh, in this study, because only a few had primary PCI, we will first, we will mainly uh, focused about door to needle time. Only uh, door, to ne door to needle time of less than 30 minutes was achieved in only 42%. Uh, median door to needle time was 40 minutes. Uh, therefore, we have space for improvement. Door to needle time has to be improved. Uh, it's also important to know that many of these patients were managed uh, in, uh, in centers where they are are no cardiologists managed by the uh, medical team. So uh, it's very important for doctors and the medical officers to know that uh, you, have to add, uh, you have to try to uh, deliver thrombolytic therapy as soon as possible because mainly the acute coronary syndromes are managed by physicians, not, not by the cardiologists. Only, only, only a uh, small percentage will present to the cardiologists. So when you look at the reasons for de uh, delays in door to needle time, first one is delay in making the diagnosis. 32% uh, had uh, delay in making the diagnosis, the reason for delay. And uh, another 42% had clinical decision issues, contacting seniors, decision on PCI versus thrombolytics, and logistic reasons like transport delays. Uh, so there, are, there is room for improvement in our setting. Uh, looking at the registry data, actually this registry is mainly from uh, centered on the National Hospital. So therefore, patients treated with primary PCI were, were higher, a higher proportion of were treated with primary PCI. Here, uh, door, door to balloon time of less than 60 minutes or first medical contact to device time of less than 60 minutes were achieved in about 14%. Uh, so again, uh, which is, uh, we, we, we can say it's below par. So we, we need to minimize these delays. 
again 53 percent received primary pc within 12 hours of symptom onset that is both systems delay and the patient, uh, patient related delay and 14 percent received primary pci within guideline recommended uh, 60 minutes even at nhsl so and non stemi patients only 30 percent received coronary angiograms within this uh, guideline recommended 72 hours when you look at the availability of primary pci a uh, distribution of primary pci capable centers is uneven both geographically and population density wise and if you look at the uh, Sri, Lanka, Sri Lankan map, there is two centers in Colombo and Kalutara in Western province. Actually, there is Colombo North and Colombo South teaching hospitals will, will be having uh, cardiac cath labs in a, in a short while. So you can see there are some provinces, uh, Sabaragamu, for example, this is the uh, population with the fifth largest population. They do not have any cath labs. Uh, North Central province, we are lucky actually, uh, it's the eighth. The population I say is the eighth province and we have two cath labs in both uh, main cities. Therefore, it's uh, the primary PCI, providing primary PCI for all the patients will not be a reality for a long time to come. So we have to focus more on timely thrombolysis. Uh, only 25% receive thrombolysis within the guideline recommended first medical contact to needle time of 30 minutes. Median door to needle time of was about 60 minutes. Now, after they had the uh, acute coronary syndrome, uh, we have to look into secondary prevention. Uh, in our setting, many patients with acute coronary syndromes have diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, or CKD. Now, significant proportion of these patients with ad admitted the acute coronary syndrome receive a new diagnosis of diabetes or hypertension because they, they until they had the acute coronary syndrome or the MI, they didn't know they were diabetic. So what they say is they got diabetes after the MI. That's what they come to the clinic and say. Uh, therefore, we have to start multiple medications. They, so when, when we treat acute coronary syndrome and we discharge them on at least five drugs. In addition, to treat these risk factors, we need multiple medica medications for diabetes about two drugs, for hypertension another two drugs. So this leads to polypharm polypharmacy and they are, they are after the ice poor compliance, which is a key barrier to achieving guideline rec recommended therapeutic goals as for secondary prevention. So we do some patient education, but there is no auditing or the quality of patient education is also uh, not consistent. And cardiac rehabilitation programs, which is available at some centers, can help in secondary prevention. So we have to achieve this uh, guideline recommended HB1C target of 7 or 6.5, depending on the patient's age, and the LDL target of 55, as uh, uh, Dr. Chantaraj mentioned earlier, um, and the blood pressure target 130 over 17, many of the patients. So targets are not achieved consistently. The clinic overcrowding is one of the major obstacle. Cardiology clinics are overcrowded when they have acute coronary syndrome. When you want to send them back to the primary care, they don't want to go back. So that is one of the major issues. So the, it's important to have a shared care between a primary care provider and specialized cardiology clinics. So, uh, so one of their main fears is when you, dish, uh, when you send them back to the primary care from the cardiology clinic, they have a fear that they have any, any if they have any other cardiac issue they can't come back to the clinic that is their fear so one way to alleviate this is uh, you you refer them back to the primary care office, uh, provider and uh, tell them at any time they have a problem you can come back to the cardiology clinic uh, and again we have to address the myths regarding medications because many patients who are taking statins will come and tell you doctor whether this drug uh, does it cause liver damage does it cause kidney damage. So although however much we educate them, the, there are myths in the society. So it's, it's very important we address their fears and myths. Otherwise, there is a possibility when they feel all right, they feel well, they might stop the medications. So when you look at the discharge medications, uh, in giving aspirin, clopidogrel, and statins, we were comparable with Western countries. But beta blockers and AC inhibitors, ARBs, we were a little bit behind, so we have to address that. 
uh, cardiac rehabilitation is also a very important part after acute coronary syndromes because a structured cardiac rehabilitation program can help patients with acute coronary events achieve a better outcome. Now, after we do a primary PCA or even a CABG, uh, the advice they receive from the society and the family and the friends is to uh, stay in the bed, not to work hard. So they are, the, the, the cost and the effort we have taken uh, to do either primary PC or CABG is wasted if they do not work and if they do not go back to work, if they do not uh, contribute to the society. So it's very important to tell them after PCI, you can work and you can, you have to go back to work. People try to uh, actually, uh, some people stop the jobs they are doing and try to stay at home. So the cardiac rehabilitation programs can help a lot in bringing patient back to their normal lifestyle. Uh, so availability and uh, auditing is also important uh, in maintaining a cardiac rehabilitation program. Like a primary PCI uh, program, cardiac rehabilitation programs are not very easy to start and it's also very difficult to continue. So there will be a lot of challenges. So. Uh, after discussing about secondary prevention, um, acute coronary syndromes are becoming a major financial burden for the already struggling healthcare system. So we cannot, we cannot, we can't go on doing primary PCIs and PCIs to all the people and provi providing CABG because it's a huge financial burden. So we have to make take steps to prevent the risk factors. So diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, sedentary li lifestyle, they are highly prevalent. Diabetes is sometimes undiagnosed and poorly controlled. And improving access to primary PCA is very costly. Community interventions such as promoting healthy eating, discouraging smoking, improving access to walking paths, cycling lanes should be streamlined. And there are a few progressive steps already taken, but uh, like uh, introducing the warnings on the, the sugar levels and salt levels in the beverages and walking tracks and picture, uh, uh, picture warnings on uh, cigarette packets, those are good steps. So everything is not negative. There's, there are some positive aspects also. Now, uh, there was a debate uh, a few, few uh, months ago regarding with the uh, Rajarat or Anuradha Pura Polonaro people, do they need walking tracks? So the people, used to think people do not need exercise they are because they the farmers do lots of physical work that, that, that is not actually true many of the farming is done by tractors and many people do not walk they uh, use scooters uh, three wheelers and bicycles are no longer used in the uh, that area so uh, they also need exercise even the farmers So looking into the future, we need community-based interventions to mitigate risk. We need organizational guidelines for direct referral and transfer. So when a patient comes with acute coronary syndromes, everybody should know where, depending on the time uh, constraints, where should the patient go and whom to contact. Uh, Pre-hospital ECG for diagnosis and decision making and transportation in equipped ambulance and trained paramedics also uh, requirement. We have a established ambulance service. We need some improvements. Uh, and possibility of pre-hospital interventions, again important in remote areas, uh, improving access to primary PCI centers and audits to minimize delays and registry which is now been established and hopefully it will uh, it will involve all, all the other possible hospitals in Sri Lanka to uh, have better idea and better idea and better data to uh, improve the quality of care we provide and regarding the cost we have to think about universal universal health insurance whether it has to be done uh, because the government is already struggling with providing consumables for cardiac cath labs uh, now the uh, you know the many doctors are migrating so brain drain is also an issue now earlier near Anuradhapura, like hospitals like Padavia, Kakirava, those places, they used to thrombolize the patients because they had a, uh, 
uh, VP or the consultant physician. So without a consultant physician, the doctors are a bit reluctant to provide thrombolytic therapy. But many of those doctors now have migrated. So they, they, are, not, they are functioning without, uh, without a cover of a consultant physician. So they, they will have to transfer all the patients to Anuradhapura for the, uh, even for thrombolysis. And other problem is now health is becoming a low priority for people with the economic problems. They, they are main problem, they, they think about where their next meal comes from. So the, although you try to uh, encourage them to do exercise, healthy eating, they have more, more concerns, uh, more basic concerns, I would say. Right, so before I finish, a few take home messages for young doctors. You can save many lives in the medical clinic and GP practice than in the cath lab or the cardiac operating theater. So we can save only one or two lives per day, but in medical clinics, you can save uh, much more lives by there's always something to be done for the patient in front of you rather than writing repeat all. So it might be some advice about dietary patterns, some advice about diabetic control, some advice about physical activity. Uh, so you have to think and if you, uh, if just without just repeating the, all the medications, you have to look into uh, optimize their medication, optimize their blood pressure. So uh, the, I, I, I'm always saying it's the medical clinics, which are the places where we can intervene to prevent acute coronary syndromes. Uh, and we need a drastic change to our dietary habits because uh, we have a usually traditionally uh, rice-based diet and we eat, on top of it, we eat lots of sweets. Uh, 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 food rich in sugar, so we, this this has to be changed. Um, and routine, you have to make that routine moderate intensity physical activity is the normal. Sedentary lifestyle is abnormal. You have to deliver th this message to your patients. And young people presenting gastritis have a high index of suspicion. Do ECG and consider doing a troponin. Thank you. Thank you, Sunit for that contribution to this audience. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Sunit, I think in, as you brought it up, the economic crisis, the, what we are facing. So what about this, the cost effectiveness and the way whether we can deliver this primary PCI or thrombolysis and how should we proceed in view of the problems we are facing now? Yeah, I think uh, at, at current stage, uh, the improving primary PCI services, I think uh, it's not going to be like uh, for all the people to have access, it won't be possible in the near future. So we have to focus uh, more on th providing timely thrombolytic therapy in the case of uh, STEMI. But also I think uh, we have to more focus more on prevention. Prevention is the way to go forward. So that uh, can it uh, we have a certificate for in appreciation. Next, we have a different sort of a presentation, a team presentation, uh, to make it more interesting. I believe that will be a case-based discussion. Uh, to lead the team will be Dr. Gautabe Ranasinghe, consultant cardiologist from the Institute of Cardiology National Hospital, Sri Lanka. He is MBBS, Colombo, MD, MRCP, FCCP, FRCP, FAPSIC, FACC and FESC. Uh, together with him, we have two senior registrars from the National Hospital Cardiology Unit, Dr. N. Pratipan and Dr. K. Tikshana Premwansa. I invite uh, you'll be starting with the yeah, Thank you. Thank you. So we uh, well, we all know that uh, acute coronary syndrome is a group of conditions associated with uh, sudden cutoff of blood supply to the heart. And I am not going to describe all the conditions, but uh, Sunit very well explained everything. And uh, of course. Uh, when it comes to etiologies, and we know that basic uh, problem is endothelial dysfunction and uh, endothelial damage and atherosclerosis. Uh, 
that's the common one but out of the box again there are rare courses because we have to understand these rare courses the different because we have to have a different uh, diagnostic as well as different uh, therapeutic approaches so this we see every day uh, is, is uh, this acute coronary syndrome patients is almost ubiquitous now and uh, so even last evening when i was walking out of my private practice young schoolboy and just out of the school came with severe chest pain ecg chest uh, the the uh, history is very typical and uh, so it's a stemi and uh, so the immediate taken to the cath lab and angiogram done perfectly clean coronary arteries of course he had an argument with some of his friends while having a fag and probably the uh, spasm is the cause so these are the rare things we should know so other than the common one so our discussion based on uh, this rare presentation we see uh, at least once a week or twice a week so so two cases we are going to present and by uh, some of my junior colleagues and so after that we'll have a discussion okay so i think pratip and will discuss the first case thanks good afternoon everyone uh, see, as i said uh, we de initially decided to go for rather than the conventional uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease we chose uh, uh, that uh, rare etiology of uh, atheros uh, acs so that uh, first of all uh, i have to thank that uh, ceylon college of physician and uh, uh, sri lanka college of cardiology uh, to giving me uh, as of this opportunity to present the case in uh, such a prestigious uh, platform uh, so let's uh, we, all the cases are very recently encountered by our uh, team uh, so the we move to the first case the 35 year old male uh, smoker uh, who had a recurrent uh, chest pain uh, uh, several episode but uh, only two episode uh, drive him to the hospital first admission in the early in the uh, uh, 2020 with a typical uh, ischemic pain with the uh, ecg changes in the inferior leads uh, with a positive troponin 9 and patient was uh, managed as in stem in the medical ward and discharged as usual and uh, but the patient uh, defaulted the clinic follow up uh, again uh, presented with the same uh, scenario in the two early 2022 uh, and uh, same changes uh, with the inferior as well as lateral changes again managed as a instemi and the patient referred to the cardiology unit and uh, then uh, during the admission uh, patient also uh, Uh, found that examination uh, height was 179 uh, no other evidence of uh, connective tissue disease uh, cardiovascular system examination was normal as well as the respiratory and uh, neurological examination also normal so basic investigations are within the normal limit uh, and we also did the uh, esr and ana also normal the chest x ray and uh, 2d echo cardiogram we didn't found any abnormalities so later we arranged the angiogram uh these are the angiogram findings uh yeah uh this is the angiogram finding uh which uh, showed as uh, the left anterior descending artery having a uh, multiple radiolusion lumen which is extending from the proximal to uh, mid vessels and uh, the circumflex arteries also had a similar finding uh, which has a proximal to mid vessel uh, spiral dissection with the multiple radiolusion lumen uh, the rce also had a <coughs> the same type of uh, dissection uh, which is uh, from the Uh, proximal to almost the distal vessels had a multiple radiolusion uh, lumens so this is a, a very rare uh, etiol rare findings uh, even that uh, the when you search in the google uh, oh, we no no case i we couldn't found it the triple vessel dissection uh, at the same in the same patient uh, so after the index procedure uh, 
after the index procedure, we didn't uh, do any intervention. Uh, we decided to go for the uh, multidisciplinary uh, discussion. So that uh, after the discussion, uh, we made the uh, diagnosis of uh, type 1 uh, coronary artery dissection. So we, for that, we followed that uh, American College of Cardiological gu Guidelines. So we, are, we found that uh, the multiple radio uh, lumen uh, with that, uh, this is the, the type 1 dissection. So the other type of dissection also the noted, uh, reported uh, by the American College of Cardiology, the type 2 dissection and as well as the type 2, 3 dissection. The type 1, type 2 dissection, uh, which is, uh, there was a luminal uh, narrowing, uh, which is uh, ex extending more than uh, 20 millimeter. The in between uh, proximal and distal has a normal segment. The type 3 dissection almost uh, similar to the, uh, the atherosclerotic plaque lesion, where the lesion was uh, less than uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 millimeter. So, so in our case, uh, we had a type 1 dissection. So in the, this is another diagram to uh, simply explain that uh, type 1 dissection, this is a multiple uh, radio lucent lumen. Uh, exactly have almost similar finding with our case. Uh, this is the type 2 dissection, uh, which is uh, the red uh, luminal narrowing, which is uh, extend up to the tip of the uh, coronary artery. And uh, this is the, uh, then the, the length of the dissection is uh, more than uh, uh, 20 millimeter. This is the type 3 dissection, where the, the very narrow, uh, less than 20 millimeter, uh, the, the in between uh, the, in between the, uh, dissection, the normal segment uh, noted. So that we made a diagnosis of uh, spontaneous uh, coronary artery dissection uh, type 1 because the uh, patient didn't have any other risk factors and new uh, examination finding, investigation uh, finding all normal. So that uh, after the discussion, uh, we may, that according to the American College of Cardiological Guideline, uh, so we made uh, our patient uh, a high risk category because uh, our patient uh, having a, a more than a two vessel dissection and uh, proximal involvement and patient uh, having ongoing symptoms during the presentation. Even during the board stay, patient has uh, developed the chest pains. So made a, we made a, the category of a high risk and uh, we proceed with the percutaneous interventions. So that the basic uh, management strategy that uh, anyway we continued the dual antiplatelet therapy uh, because considering that uh, the dissected plaque uh, initiate the thrombus and uh, it will uh, uh, propagate the thrombus. So prevent that uh, we continued the dual antiplatelet therapy as well as the uh, beta blocker as well because it shows that uh, reduce uh, recurrence rate. And initially we gave the high intensity statin therapy. Later on we found that. Uh, it is uh, no use of then reduced to uh, low intensity statin therapy. Then uh, as our patient is a high risk, we uh, proceed with the percutaneous coronary intervention and we covered with the three uh, coronary arteries with the stent. And, uh, and also we um, uh, give the lifestyle modification as he is a smoker. Uh, smoking, uh, uh, we advise to stop smoking and also I arrange the cardiac rehabilitation, especially the uh, psychological part. So the main, in our case, uh, the uh, main drawback is uh, during the diagnosis, uh, we should have used that uh, IVAS catheter, but uh, because of the limited uh, availability of the, the IVAS catheter, uh, we couldn't perform it. And also thought of initially uh, avoiding that uh, because angiographic uh, dissection of uh, type 1 is a pathognomonic. So even though that uh, uh, we could have done after multidisciplinary meeting with the multiple experts, uh, they advised to proceed with the IVAS catheter, uh, even a pre and post uh, procedure. Uh, this was the, our um, angiographic finding uh, following the uh, coronary intervention. Uh, the, uh, luckily, we didn't have any uh, c complication during the wire crossing. So the and first angiographic finding was uh, success uh, satisfactory. This is the RCA following the standing. <coughs> so the patient, after a couple of days of hospital uh, stay, we were, we discharged the patient with the clinic follow. 
So the basic uh, management principle where what we applied is the is a optimal medical therapy for the old patient uh, because this is a backbone of the all the type of uh, coronary artery dissections. And uh, the most of the according to the guideline, most of the cases uh, they advise to manage uh, conservatively if the patient is in the low risk category. And the high risk category uh, patients need a coronary revascularization. So in our case, we made a pay the high risk uh, category, so patient managed with the coronary intervention as well as the uh, medical therapy. And cardiac rehabilitation we have arranged. And, uh, and also that uh, spontaneous coronary, most of the patient, more than 50% of the patient with the uh, spontaneous uh, coronary artery dissection, uh, we should have uh, associated with the fibromuscular dysplasia. So that uh, at the end of the, during the discharge, uh, we have arranged the the vascular screening to identify the uh, fibromuscular dis uh, dysplasia. So the, the results are yet to come. Uh, this is our first case. Uh, this is the second case. Uh, this is, uh, we, uh, I got a call uh, from the accident and service unit uh, while we doing the on-call. The 19-year-old boy, uh, the previously healthy patient, uh, uh, healthy, uh, admitted to the accident and uh, trauma unit uh, uh, following the accident with the train. But uh, luckily, patient is uh, stable. Only, uh, and he complained of the chest pain uh, uh, from the uh, big admission. So initially, they thought of it some uh, mechanical pain. Uh, later on, uh, they uh, did the ECG, and after the ECG finding only, they called us. So after detailed analysis, uh, Detailed history, we found that uh, the family history and other history was not, not, not significant. In the examination, the patient is alert. Uh, there is only compound fracture in the right knee joint. The cardiovascular system, uh, normal. Uh, respiratory system, there was a right-sided uh, pleural effusion was uh, there with uh, reduced breath sounds, uh, but uh, clinically not significant. The abdominal examination, we did for look for the, any major organ uh, uh, injuries, uh, uh, liver laceration, or uh, renal or splenic involvement, uh, they, they, everything was uh, excluded uh, in the examination. So in the ECG source, the, there was uh, inferior ST elevations uh, in the 2, 3, and APF. Uh, and they did the troponin. Troponin I also positive is more than uh, 30. The basic investigation normal, and the echocardiogram finding source uh, with the good ejection fraction with the regional wall motion abnormalities. So we took the patient to the cath lab uh, where we found that uh, there is a dissection in the right coronary artery, uh, which is uh, well explained here with the proximal uh, thrombus burden. So that uh, this time also, uh, we initially managed that uh, during the normal procedure when we take to the cath lab, uh, patient is loaded with the loading dose with the aspirin and clopidogrel and heparin therapy was given as well as the high dose of statin. And uh, we already discussed with the surgical team, uh, if we are taking the cath lab in case we put any uh, stenting, uh, can't proceed with the routine surgical intervention. So they excluded the, all the uh, cranial, uh, uh, intracranial hemorrhage and uh, liver less or intra abdominal organ injuries. So while we're doing the procedures, uh, angiogram, we uh, standard the uh, RCA. So this time also, we unable to perform the IVA scan uh, uh, because of the limited availability of uh, uh, IVA catheter. But uh, we had a some small technique uh, which can be demonstrated by the angiographically the dissection. So when we uh, put the balloon after the post dilatation uh, when the balloon is inserted the uh, the balloon is in the coronary vessels the di di distal blood flow was noted so when we took the balloon to the catheter the di distal flow was uh, zero so timi zero so the, it mean that uh, dissected plaque uh, the uh, obstructing the lumen so when the balloon is inside the flow was good. So we confirmed the dis uh, dissection by the coronary angiogram. So <coughs> we have standard uh, because of the hemoda, we have to preserve the myocardium. And while doing the procedure, we noticed that uh, 
they have the coronary they have abnormal origin so the left coronary uh, left coronary artery as well as the right coronary artery in this originate from the same place so that uh, we arrange that uh, ct coronary angiogram uh, to exclude the uh, to confirm the origin as well as exclude the malignant cause of coronary artery which is mean that we uh, uh, passing between the aorta and the pulmonary artery <coughs> So we the, we did the CT angiogram. CT angiogram is uh, confirmed that uh, it's originate from the left coronary cusp as well as it uh, passing in between the aorta uh, in the pulmonary trunk. So the basic management principle where, which we apply here is uh, hold the patient with the trauma to the chest or chest uh, trauma patient with the trauma complaining of chest pain. We have to think of uh, myocardial infarction could be due to the coronary artery dissection. So if a patient complaining of chest pain with the ECG changes, we have to, uh, from the workup, cardiovascular workup with the EC, uh, echocardiography, troponin, and uh, we have to arrange the coronary angiography. So in this case, uh, we uh, actually the continue, there is no atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we decided to give the dual antiplatelet therapy for six weeks, uh, then change to the uh, single antiplatelet therapy as the patient also wanted to go for the surgical uh, intervention for the uh, right side uh, knee joint fracture. The other, but the other principle is the all the uh, coronary dissection can be managed with the stending as well as uh, conservatively. In our case, uh, we had a distal timid, uh, almost a zero flow, so we manage with the uh, right coronary uh, standing because we have to preserve the myocardium. And in the resource uh, poor setting, we can demonstrate the dissection even with the symbol angiography. Then uh, all the patient with the uh, coronary anomalous origin, we have to confirm with the CT coronary angiogram. Uh, these are, this is our second case. Uh, then uh, other type of the dissect, uh, dissection which usually encountered in the day-to-day -day practice, uh, which is the, we got a call from the, again from the ET uh, uh, medical ward. So 59-year-old fisherman, previously healthy, no other risk factors uh, for the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, he presented with the typical uh, ischemic chest pain uh, with the nausea and vomiting of more than four hours. In the history, family history, and uh, not significant, uh, and patient initially uh, the examination finding also normal. Patient initially managed uh, in the medical ward uh, um, and uh, managed with the dual antiplatelet therapy, high intensity statin, and uh, the ECG source, uh, uh, the an anterior STEMI on the day one of admission. So where patient was uh, managed with the thrombolysis and they, ha they have started uh, enoxaparin as well. During the worst day, day three of admission, uh, patient has developed a complete heart block, and uh, patient initially got the electrophysiology opinion, and uh, they have uh, placed the uh, temporary pacemaker. Then later on, we refer to our uh, cath lab. Uh, we found that uh, there is a dissection uh, from extending from the, the proximal LAD to the mid vessel, and as well as we found the dissection on the right coronary artery. So that during the, in, so here also same, during the index procedure, uh, we didn't uh, intervene, but uh, in a one, two, uh, two later, we thought of a patient with the, considering the age, uh, we thought of it could be a atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease and or coronary artery dissection. So we wanted to perform the IVA scan. So we arranged the IVA scan, which shows that uh, LAD had a, atherosclerotic uh, plaque with the dissected plaque with the intramural hematoma. RCE also, we had a large intramural hematoma with the mild atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, because of the, the atherosclerotic plaque burden, we extended uh, the LAD and RCA because the large hematoma, we thought of uh, putting a stent with the uh, uh, with the large hematoma, the later on they may patient presented with the restenosis and uh, malaposition of the stain. So as the distal flow as the distal flow was good, so we decided to manage the conservatively with RCA. Uh, this is the LAD was stained uh, and shows that uh, well lapo stain following the procedure. So the the basic management principle uh, applied here is the. Uh, 
atherosclerotic plaque related uh, dissection should be managed as a conventional acs so the these are the three cases uh, uh, different type of dissection and the different aspect uh, we manage in a different way uh, we have another case uh, which will be presented by the dr tikshana uh, good afternoon everyone uh, thank you uh, silon college of physician and also uh, College of Cardiologists uh, for giving us uh, to uh, present on this uh, forum. Uh, so next case, bit of uh, medicine plus uh, rheumatology and cardiology, everything is there. So bit a long case. Uh, she is a 33-year-old female from uh, Kegol, actually followed up at uh, National Hospital Candy initially. Eva evaluated for uh, young hypertension since uh, 2018 and had several episodes of TIA and minor stroke with a ri uh, residual right side weakness. And also during the COVID period, she had uh, some uh, defaulted follow-up and history of three miscarriages during that period. And during evaluation, there was a positive ANA theta about uh, 1 in 80 like, and also normal uh, C3, C4, and uh, negative DSTNA and a rheumatoid factor. And because of this TIA, and they have done a, a NCCT, which has, uh, which has shown a multiple lacuna infarction, and which was later, uh, from an MRI, they have found a cerebral vasculitis. And during evaluation, they have found some proteinuria also, and uh, for that, they have uh, evaluated and done a CT autogram, which showed a large visual vasculitis with involving aorta and also the ostia also. Uh, because of these thrombotic episodes, and uh, they have arranged uh, anticoagulant, uh, lupus anticoagulant, this means uh, anti phospholipid screening also, so which became positive again. So actually, she was on uh, aspirin, atorvastatin, losartan, and prednisolone, met, uh, methyl dopa, and MMF. Uh, unfortunately, she was not on uh, anticoagulation, but plan was to initiate an anticoagulation if she's become pregnant again. So patient come to us, patient came to us uh, on a casualty day. Uh, actually, she came with the faintishness and chest uh, tightness to the ETU uh, with the GCS around 12. And uh, during the ETU, uh, before doing anything else, she had a left-sided focal GCS followed by a, a secondary generalization. And after recovery only, they were able to assess the patient and with a tachycardia and low BP. And uh, ECG was uh, found to have this. So you know, previously also uh, we had a similar ECG in the previous case. It's an inferior STEMI. So I will uh, then they call for the emergency cardiac team uh, uh, for a rescue PCI. So during uh, PCI, usually we go by the uh, right uh, radial axis, but in this patient, maybe because of uh, low BP, plus the, uh, because of the history, you know, as already diagnosed patient with vasculitis, we couldn't feel any radial pulse. So then uh, we get, went for the right uh, uh, femoral axis, that is our next approach. Uh, but as you can see, that also why I didn't went through. So you can see there is... Uh, there is narrowing in the femoral artery also. So then, luckily, we were able to get it done through the uh, left femoral axis. So this is, actually it's an uh, inferior STEMI, so usually we first go by the uh, RCA catheterization and it showed uh, there is an acute uh, obstruction in the right coronary artery. And also, before doing the procedure, then we uh, went with the left uh, left coronary can, uh, catheterization as well. Again, which shows both uh, LAD and circ. So all triple vessels had obstruction in the same time, coming as an inferior STEMI. So then, uh, as uh, Sir mentioned, uh, uh, anyway, our management approach should be a PCI strategy. So we stented. So this is after stenting the RCA, you can see the uh, distal TME flow, TME3 flow. And this is the LAD. 
and again the sac. So patient underwent uh, three instant like a bypass at the same time. So, so I would like to uh, show some another interesting finding. We did uh, while coming out, we did the uh, autogram as well. So if you can appreciate, there are some there's some uh, secular dilatation of the aorta as well and also some uh, osteal involvement of the uh, uh, renal. You can see the, uh, this is a uh, renal artery of the right side you can appreciate. Okay, so this is after stenting. You can see the first TCG is before the stenting. There's uh, absolute resolution following the stenting. But unfortunately, it was a big uh, right ventricular infarction. Patient uh, actually about after three days, like uh, patient succumbed to death because of uh, massive. Uh, she had a uh, acute liver injury and plus a uh, AKI. Uh, maybe because of the congestive hepatopathy plus the contrast dose, or maybe uh, her contributing to her illness. So where is our patient now? So. As you know, I, I have mentioned in the history. So she had uh, several episodes of uh, thrombosis. And plus, uh, there were unexplained T1 miscarriages and also positive lupus anticoagulant. So there are a lot of uh, medicine people here. Now you know what is the diagnosis. So it's uh, APLS. Then, whether it's a primary or secondary, again, uh, she had a history of proteinuria and post positive antiphospholipid ant antibodies. We don't know the reason for the seizures. The NCCT brain at the ETU was normal anyway. And she had a positive uh, ANA also. So as you all know now, in the latest guideline, there is, uh, you, there is no diagnostic criteria for SLE, but there is a classification criteria only. So even with or without uh, the positive ANA, you can come to a diagnosis. For our patient, she had a positive ANA anyway, and she had uh, some clinical features plus immunologic criteria also. So it's basically clinical diagnosis. So case is most likely uh, APLS secondary to uh, SLE. So I would uh, briefly describe uh, about uh, the cardiac manifestations of SLE. So when it comes to the cardiac manifestation, there are disease-related plus uh, treatment-related uh, side uh, manifestations. So when it comes to the disease-related, we have coronary artery disease, now we are going to discuss, and also non-coronary manifestations. So starting from uh, valvular heart disease, can be a nodules, small nodules, and starting from mitral valve prolapse to regurgitation, even aortic valve regurgitation, and also this specific uh, counterpart that non-bacterial thromboembolic uh, endocarditis, also called that Marantic or Veruke, Veruke endocardi uh, endocarditis, which is a thrombotic. So in such patients, you have to anticoagulate that patient. So and then going from inside to out, you have the myocardium, you can have myocarditis. And with the myocarditis, you can get conduction abnormalities out of which yeah, it, uh, tachycardia is the most common manifestation and also uh, atrial fibrillation and QT prolongation they can be either due to disease or uh, due to uh, treatment also you as you all know HCQ is well known to cause uh, QT prolongation and also pericardial disease from pericarditis to uh, effusion to tamponade is there and also treatment related because this patient may be on HCQ, prednisolone, and cytotoxic treatment like uh, uh, cyclopasmide and also biologics. So all can contribute to this cardiac manifestation. So I am not going to discuss detail about the other manifestation because this is basically about this uh, coronary heart disease. So it's a silent killer in SLE patient that uh, some studies have found the patients, mainly females who have died due to other causes, they have found about 50% they have substantial atherosclerosis in the autopsies. So when we compare to the risk, uh, when compared with the other general population, it has about two times increased risk of uh, whatever the uh, cardiovascular disease manifestation, MI, ischemic stroke, and even peripheral vascular disease. 
So in SLE, it is basically due to in, there is increased risk of accelerated atherosclerosis and also thromboembolic risk is there, especially who are having positive antipospilipid antibodies. And also they can have involvement of vasculitis, like in uh, our patient. So pathogenesis, uh, I'm not going to in discuss in detail. Still, actually, it's uh, poorly understood. Uh, so basically, as you all know, there is uh, uh, reduced apoptotic body uh, cell uh, clearance and uh, altered T and B cell uh, response, which will lead into uh, uh, immune complex and this will damage the vascular permeability and later complement activation that is why you get uh, consumptive uh, hypocomplementemia in the acute phase and then also they will activate the PMNs, uh, polymorphonuclear cells and they will damage further as discussed previously it is uh, uh, the atherosclerosis is a uh, counterpart of uh, inflammation so, when it comes to lupus vasculitis, it's mainly we see is small vessel vasculitis. You uh, can present with mononeuritis multiplex, uh, retinal and renal involvement, and also pulmonary hemorrhages. This medium to large and uh, large vessel vasculitis is very rare. But in our patient, uh, we don't know the exact reason. Uh, she had defaulted follow-up as well, and she had anyway the large vessel involvement as well. So management, basically, you have to made it uh, according to your patient. You have to go for a good history, examination, investigation, and treatment, back to basics. So anyway, if a patient with a diagnosed uh, rheumatic heart disease, sorry, a rheumatic condition like SLE, coming with chest pain or atypical uh, shortness of breath, you can have vast uh, differential diagnosis. So these are some of the differential diagnoses. So in the examination, if you find some purpura, Raynaud phenomenon, gangrene, and peripheral, reduced peripheral pulses, or in absence peripheral pulses, like our patient had, then uh, any bruise. So you can suspect atherosclerosis, uh, atherosclerosis and also involvement of large vessels. So investigations, uh, in a, as in a normal patient, you can do these ECGs and TMTs. The specific investigations which are us uh, usually not mentioned in the, uh, the cardiac setting are these uh, ankle brachial pressure index, carotid doppler, sorry, uh, and carotid doppler. They are not validated actually, but they have a good uh, positive predictive value. If you have patients and you can, uh, if you suspect, if you have a higher degree of suspicion, you can order this, uh, you can do actually uh, AB, P pressure index and the carotid doppler, if there are plaques and the ABP index is less than 0.9, uh, that is suggestive of involvement of the uh, vascular, there is evidence of vascular disease. Then you can go ahead with the either uh, CTCA or with uh, either one of the invasive uh, methods to confirm. So management uh, is like any uh, cardiovascular disease, it's basically a uh, involvement of uh, if patient coming in acute coronary settings like in our patient you have to go for a P PCI strategy or non STEMI then you have to go for a uh, anticoagulation so otherwise uh, the management should uh, include uh, risk factor management so that's basically lifestyle medication and control of other comorbid conditions and also in such patients control of disease activity is also important and the other thing is the adjustment of uh, medic medication. As I mentioned, you have to minimize the dose of dose and the duration of the steroid and also uh, use of cardiac friendly steroid sparing agents like MTX and the definitive treatment as I mentioned. So these things I won't, uh, I won't, I will, I won't discuss in details. This is from the latest uh, Euler recommendation. Actually, you can, uh, you all know better than me. So, Definitive treatment, as I mentioned, after a PCI strategy or after diagnosing uh, coronary artery disease, there are uh, evidence for statins and aspirin, and also uh, the other drug which, drugs which have mortality benefit. And the problem is in my patient, 
as you can remember she had several episodes and the thing is uh, she was not started on anticoagulation so and the other thing is the place for statin in the primary prevention for this patient so nowhere in the guideline in SLE or anything they don't mention about the primary prevention strategy and indication for a statin so what they recommend is usual uh, use the other uh, score methods like you score 2 to predict their uh, mortality uh, and uh, decide on that so the problem is uh, coronary heart disease prediction models for this uh, using this score 2 system and all it's uh, not validated in patient with rheumatic uh, heart uh, rheumatic conditions and as you all know in the statins it has several actions so it has uh, uh, reduce uh, inflammation and it will uh, prevent uh, it will uh, increase the apoptosis which is uh, we will uh, have more benefit in the SLE patients and also it will reduce uh, vascular inflammation and remodeling as well and also the place for the aspirin in primary prevention in patient currently they recommend in SLE patients only in uh, uh, in pregnancy only as like uh, in pregnant patient uh, but you have to again individualize the patient depending on the history and all uh, if you found uh, because as uh, also mentioned now we are having uh, limited resources and if a patient is having such comorbidity after uh, MI or TIA or stroke for so patients uh, whole life is going to be a disaster so then you have to individualize you have to discuss with the patient there's increased right, uh, risk of bleeding but uh, these are the benefits you can go, you can gain with uh, aspirin and all. So what they recommend is have a multidisciplinary uh, team discussion and go for the primary prevention medication. So that's what uh, basically I have to uh, uh, discuss. So uh, again, back to basis, go through uh, history properly and do examination and investigation according to your patient and treatment strategy should be a tailor-made one. Okay, thank you. I think uh, you can understand the diverse nature of the, even these rare presentations like dissection. So first patient was, uh, he presented, I mean, dissection-wise also, there can may be various triggers. One is trauma. Trauma cause uh, actually sudden trauma, especially motor traffic accidents, could cause uh, uh, the um, dissection of coronary artery. Always you have to suspect. And then another one is um, uh, atherosclerosis. Now I think our case, the second case, third case is atherosclerosis. Even with mild to moderate plaque disease, one can have uh, uh, the dissection. So that also is spontaneous dis dissection. There is no trigger. So but atherosclerosis is there. And the second case, I think there's a fisherman, right? And uh, I don't know whether even his occupation is fisherman because they, I think he got this chest pain after after he um, uh, the went to uh, after he came from uh, sea, and then uh, so whether he was like paddling or whatever, the caused a lot of exertion, and then that triggered little uh, the dissection there. So. Even these so-called spontaneous rare cases, I think there is always trigger. So for, for us to learn, and that, that will be very helpful to educate them. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the, these cases. And I think your case, uh, the SLE, of course, uh, patients, um, uh, they, you, we all know that SLE has uh, so multi-organ involvement, vasculitis, and then we all, we, we all were taught, even medical students, like they have uh, accelerated atherosclerosis, so they can have ischemic heart disease. And more than that, I think inflammation, the endothelial dysfunction. And so that's the root cause for, uh, I think, atherosclerosis, early atherosclerosis. There is uh, all the cholesterol and all can be normal, but uh, because of the endothelial dysfunction, you can have LDL oxidized, and then ultimately you get atherosclerosis. And without even atherosclerosis, they can have infarct because of the vasculitis of coronary arteries and uh, thrombosis. And so those are the things I think we want to highlight with these three cases. Always have a, a suspicion. And then when just because you see a STEMI case and acute coronary event and just jump at saying, thinking that this is, um, uh, this is a case of atherosclerosis and then we should manage as it is. There can be rare ones like uh, as we illustrated. That's a take home message I want to convey.
பாத்திய Thank you. I'm uh, Anil Patirana uh, in the same team. And uh, I think these patients, rare patients, we got in rapid succession over the last two months. And uh, so I think uh, Dr. as Go Dr. Gotabe uh, and uh, Sunit was telling about change in uh, demography of atherosclerotic uh, thrombotic disease uh, as a cause of acute chronic syndrome. And uh, more of uh, lately, we are also seeing, I think I would suspect uh, whether there's a change in etiology also. And uh, we see most of the patients who are having uh, myocardial injury by troponin rise and clinical presentation. When you do the angiograms, uh, they have non-obstructive non disease. We call the myocardial infarction is non-obstructive coronary arteries. Even uh, yesterday we had two patients. And I mean, uh, I, that's anecdotally whether we need uh, to look at different etiologies. Uh, as Dr. Gotabe said, uh, all these are, uh, at the end, it boils down to the endothelial dysfunction and even novel, uh, novel risk factors uh, of even acute and uh, long standing atherosclerotic disease itself uh, coming up with uh, air pollution, particulated matters in the air. Uh, so we are facing that uh, now in Sri Lanka uh, nowadays, uh, so as well as the psychosocial stress whether it's going to be a, a trigger for the acute event as well as for the you know, chronic accelerated atherosclerosis. So uh, that is one of the things that we have to be keeping in mind uh, in our setting where there's a, you know, uh, economic uh, downfall have a direct impact on that. So social, uh, economic, uh, social determinants of health affect the atherosclerotic and coronary artery disease as well, uh, directly and indirectly. So the, those are the few things. And other things that uh, though we, when we come to a clinical encounter, uh, if patients with acute chest pain, uh, so we take it as uh, acute chronic syndrome as a clinical diagnosis and re-stratify them. And uh, you know, almost all those patients at one stage, uh, depending on the risk, would need uh, invasive uh, assessment or, or imaging of the coronary arteries, with, uh, at least with invasively or non-invasively. Then we find that uh, various etiologies other than atherosclerotic uh, thromb uh, obstructive coronary artery disease. These are the few instances that we highlighted. So uh, whether we, uh, as Sunit highlighted, whether we'll have every, all, or most of our, at least uh, significant portion of our Sri Lankan population will have that facility of evaluating their coronary arteries uh, is an issue uh, to consider. And when it comes to the rare causes like this, uh, we are, we are, the evidence is not that much. And so we had to take, uh, sit back and take uh, time and discuss with our colleagues and other experts and go through and decide what is the best management. And uh, so sometimes it is very difficult. Uh, uh, so this first patient, uh, ideally, we, as he said, we needed uh, IVAS. And, uh, but then we, uh, we thought of not intervening immediately. But uh, then we put uh, for local purchase that item. And by that time, it took a long time. And uh, so we, we decided not to uh, depend on IVAS and go ahead. But that was a beneficial. That item was available for the third patient to have the IVAS uh, because that was local purchase about two or eight weeks later. So, so that is the way the things move. And we have to adapt and uh, give the best care to the patient, uh, depending on the situation and depending on the available facilities. I think that's a bit of overview. I think we had a. Uh, good uh, condensed overview of acute chronic syndromes today. That's good. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Any thoughts on now? These days, everything under the sun is blamed on the COVID vaccination. Oh, any, yes. <laughs> we have, we have, I think do we have any data we have serious, or we look into that? Uh, serious, uh, think about it post COVID and post vaccine, post COVID vaccine, whether they have, there are a uh, few uh, ideas are circulating even in the social media, no? With sudden yeah. death syndromes yeah. and uh, these sort of things, no? Um, Probably yeah, a good thing to collect data and see, I think, rather than sort of otherwise, yeah. next time we need a vaccine, we'll have a problem. Yeah. Actually, uh, the, uh, we, we see patients uh, uh, with uh, patient after COVID, I think maybe vaccination, maybe acute infection. I have seen, I mean, anecdotally. And, but we, I don't think we have data. I think I just started uh, collecting patients with uh, Jayavadhanapura team. And probably in future, we'll be able to produce some data whether we have a uh, link with uh, uh, COVID and coronary artery disease. But by experience, we see, uh, I mean, even my colleague will tell, the, we, we have seen, I think, after COVID, uh, uh, 
uh, cure coronary pain. Even we have stented during peak of the uh, epidemic, uh, the patients with uh, COVID and coming with uh, STEMI. That's, I think, almost uh, certain. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you very much to all the presenters uh, on behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians. And I would like to hand over the certificate for the last three uh, presenters uh, led by Dr. Gotabe and uh, Dr. Piritipan and Dr. Tikshna. Could you please come on stage to collect? Thank you very much for all the participants and special thank goes to uh, Dr. Dinesh Amartunga for coordinating on behalf of the, our council. Thank you for doing that hard work and getting everybody ready. That's I think was a very uh, successful meeting we had today. Thank you very much for the College of Cardiologists as well. Thank you. <laughs>